Greetings, this is Jamie Susky speaking. On behalf of my collaborators, Eric Yan, Mark Drew, and Chris Lees, thanks for visiting our audio summary for our Environmental Restoration Project, supported by the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program, or CERTUP. This project was in response to CERTUP's statement of need on a defensible approach to assess risks of per- and polyfluoro alkyl substances, or PFAS, to threatened and endangered species on Department of Defense sites. The overall objective of this research was to develop a framework for natural resource managers to quickly assess the likelihood of PFAS exposure and risk to threatened and endangered species on DoD land. To address this objective, we developed one, a methodology for determining spatial overlap of T and E species on DoD sites with areas of HFLF release, two, prioritization for T and E species with the greatest exposure potential, and then three, conducted a species-specific probabilistic risk assessment on two listed species with high exposure potentials. In developing the species-specific habitat exposure potential, we first collected data on all listed species expected to be found at a particular installation using the Integrated Natural Resource Management Plan, or NRAMP, as well as federal, state, and county resources. Next, extensive literature searches were conducted on the life history traits of the identified species. We need to know what habitat they occupy, what their home range is, so how far they might travel, as well as dietary preferences, where do they need to go for food. We then married this information with GIS land cover layers that were obtained from the installations and supplemented with open sources to develop realistic spatial scenarios of geographic locations that would support the individual listed species. For example, the northern pine snake would be in a pine forest land cover, have loose sandy soils, and from published literature, the home range would be 105 acres off of this optimal habitat for travel and foraging. Using the figure here of Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, the optimal nesting habitat for the bald eagle is in light green patches and the home range is, is shown as black hash marks. Here, it is easy to see that the bald eagle will travel far while foraging. After defining the species-specific geographic areas, we overlaid known AFFF release locations and used topographic features and groundwater flow direction to extrapolate movement of PFAS across landscape features and terminating this at a surface water body. In this figure, those AFFF release sites are identified in red and the potential drainage areas and PFAS migration are indicated by purple hash marks. From integrating both the habitat and the expected HFLF impacted area, we can calculate potential PFAS exposure to listed species within their optimal habitat and across their home range to determine which species may be at the greatest risk of exposure. From this effort, we found that those species with small home ranges, such as listed invertebrates and songbirds, may have higher exposure potential. However, we also found that it is important to consider more than a single life stage. For example, from our exposure potential modeling, the bald eagle and other raptors have lower exposure potential when compared to songbirds. However, nestlings, or eaglets, end up having fairly high exposure. So for the bald eagle, a probabilistic exposure model was developed, assuming a realistic diet of mammal and fish with the probability of PFAS contamination using published concentrations. We focused on the eaglet, as this may be the most vulnerable life stage, because of the disproportionately high ingestion rates compared to their body weight. Model simulations were comprised of a thousand replicate eaglets and the mean exposure over the developmental period of 60 days was the average daily intake. We found eaglets may receive PFAS exposures greater than the currently available toxicity reference value of 0.021 milligrams per kilogram per day on a daily basis. Importantly, we view this as preliminary there is a persistent gap in PFAS concentrations measured in the environmental compartments, the variability of PFAS through time, and any quantifiable effects occurring to wildlife receptors in the field. Closing this gap is paramount in our understanding of PFAS effects to listed species and wildlife as a whole.